wrong window. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully I got all this working right. I think so. Um, a little flush cheeks today because I spent today outside uh, cutting down our front yard, which was knee high with really thick grass. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry for those who are across the pond. Good evening to uh, my european and or european area people um yeah i know it's evening for you i appreciate that you that you tuned in and i i'm gonna start with just an apology i um i for some reason i thought that i had covered in recent videos all about cron tab and it turns out that's actually section 1.4 of the linux plus uh, objective so i'm going to talk about cron and the at daemon and all that stuff soon and i haven't yet so i set everybody up to fail on this weekend assignment and for that i apologize but um yeah i, I will just do a really quick uh primer on cron tab before i talk about like the issue that i wanted to address which is that the path variable just doesn't work right it, it, i mean it works but it's just screwed up in cron tab and it's really annoying it's something that i've always found annoying and i wanted to talk about it so anyway um um daughter is calling i'm gonna text my daughter and say i'm on the live stream uh, no i'm gonna answer right on the phone ready here we go hello amanda you're on my live stream with me what's up that's all right do you want me to call you back okay i love you oh everybody says hi amanda <laughs> she says hello <laughs> all right talk to you later love you bye <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah, uh, I have no idea what she needed, but it didn't seem to be too pressing. Anyway, um, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, um, oh, I nearly lost my way, but we'll talk really quickly about cron tab, and then, yeah, I want to talk about the path variable. Oh, that's what I wanted to, yeah, my hair color is coming back. Uh, I, I think I'm going to dye it green a little bit longer like i'll probably re-dye it green just because i'm i kind of like it green uh, however um it's pretty clear that i can't keep it green forever because if you follow me on social media you know that my middle child uh got engaged this past week i think it was this past week was it this past week did i talk about this in the last i might no it was during the live stream last sunday that she was getting engaged i remember now uh so anyway i don't think i'm gonna be allowed to have green hair during her wedding so um they're gonna get married probably next fall so anyway i have uh i have enough time uh to have fun colored hair but yeah it, it is it's starting to turn pretty brown so i'm gonna have to uh re-dye that but anyway i want to cover uh some cron tab stuff because I, I felt really bad um and then once we once I just explain how cron tab works, and you, you might know, you might not, um, then I'll talk about how I address the path variable issue. Uh, so I uh, I just I just want to keep talking. I I really enjoy the live stream here, but um, and I guess I could I could give a couple of people just time to to join. Oh yeah, it was during the live stream. Yeah yeah, my bad my bad. Um, do green until Christmas. I, I suppose I could, uh, I mean, green until Christmas. That's, you know, that's long enough. It'll be fun. I'll probably get tired of it by then. Right. Um, do I miss a live stream? Granddaughter. Got, oh, baptized last week. Congrats. Yes. Uh, yeah, the live stream is always something. I mean, it's always available if you, you know, if you miss something that uh, we covered, I don't remember what we covered last week. I don't remember what the weekend assignment was. That probably speaks volumes about how, how important it was. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's always there. And I do try to update the the link to the weekend assignment with the solution after the fact. So if you like look at it and like, oh, what the heck? Uh, I try to update that. And I don't know that I got them all updated all the way going back, but I do try to do that now during the week. Uh, Dark Spring, hello. Uh, Dwayne, yes, uh, thanks. It was it was great. I really like the guy that proposed to her too. He's a great guy. Um, I'm, I'm really excited for them. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, Shane. Yeah, last week was the Netcat website. Okay, and that was actually really fun. I really enjoyed that. So I'm sad that I didn't remember that. Shame on me, because that was that was kind of super fun. So um, let us let me just start by uh, showing a little bit about what CronTab is. So CronTab, and again, this is going to be probably, I don't know when we'll get to the, probably next week, we'll get to section 1.4 of the Linux Plus objectives. Um, but uh, let's... Let's just, this is like a quick preview when I go more in depth there. 
uh, now I can go here, right? Is the, uh, yep, microphone still working? Good. All right, so here uh, I'm just on the command line and basically cron tab is just, uh, sorry, it's gonna be noisy while I move my microphone. Uh, my headset microphone doesn't work anymore, which really, really annoys me. Um, I don't know what the deal is there. I just can't get it to work right. It's really noisy. But anyway, uh, so CronTab is just a scheduler. So if you're a Windows person, you're probably used to Windows scheduler. I'm going to move my chat box so I can see it while I'm looking at this camera over here. Um, and to edit that, it's really simple, actually, to edit. Just every user has their own CronTab as well. There's a system-wide Cron. We're going to cover all that in the in the video that I do. But to edit your own, you just do cron tab dash E. The first time it'll ask you what editor you want to use, Nano or VI. Um, surprise, surprise, I chose VI when it asked me. And basically, you the, it'll start with a blank cron tab, and this will execute commands for you on a schedule. And the schedule is the little bit of a confusing part. There's five fields, and right here, it, it will actually show you those five fields in order. And what they stand for is minute so what minute of the hour so let's say we want to start at the top of the hour so we'd say zero uh what hour of the day and this is a 24 hour uh, zero to 23 hours so uh let's say we wanted to do it at 6 a.m so uh six and then the third field is the day of the month so do you want this just on like the 13th of every month at 6 a.m. to happen. Or if you want it every day of the month, you can do an asterisk. And asterisk works on all of them. So if we wanted every minute, we could put an asterisk in the first field. Every hour, we could do it there. Um, so that's the third field. The fourth field is the month. So which month? 1 through 12. Uh, let's say we want it um, 6 a.m. every day of the week, only during October. Does that make sense? And so it's only going to be in October. And then day of the week is the last, the fifth field here. And generally, this is going to be a star like every day of the week. Um, however, if the rest of them are stars or something, you could just say like uh, zero through seven, like you only want it on Mondays or whatever. But since I've specified the... Uh, I guess the the day of the month is every day. So this would probably be fine. Then it would just do, if I like did a one, it would be Monday. So it would do every Monday at 6 a.m. in October. And so you, you, you kind of, you can get pretty specific doing it that way. Uh, but sometimes you can shoot yourself in the foot. If you say only on, like if you say the day of the month on the first of the month, but and then for day of the week, you put a number here like one, which is Monday, then it will only execute if the first of the month happens to also be a Monday. So you have to be really careful there. Um, and day of the week, zero is Sunday and also seven is Sunday. Thought that was interesting. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, the first five fields and then you just say what command. So um, we could say echo, this is cool. And you could put the results into um, ohm cool.txt and then it will put that into your home directory um, uh, at 6 a.m. every day in October. Okay, so that's basically how CronTab works. One of the frustrating th parts though is the path that is inherited by um, CronTab is not the same as the path that you have as, a, as your normal environment. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean here. So I'm going to save this. Okay, so now that actually will happen in my thing on the every whatever it was <laughs> in October. Uh, but if we were to look at our current path variable, this shows us a list. And this actually was in a video that I linked in the weekend assignment. This shows us all of the places in our local file system that Bash will look for an executable if we just type the name of an executable. Like the echo command happens to be in, let's see if we do which echo, uh, it is in user bin. And if we look up here for user bin, right there. So, oh no, that's user s bin. Uh, user bin is right there. So that's in our path. That's why when we type echo, it executes echo because it is in the path where it looks for executables. But cron tab is a little bit different. Um, 
cron does have a path variable and look I'll, I'll show you what i mean and lewis and i might have the the my my words incorrect here so uh, you know that that's fine but you can look and see so cron tab dash e what i'm going to do let me get rid of this that was just a silly example uh but let's do every minute every sec or every minute every hour every day of of the year right so basically five asterisk means this is going to happen every single minute what i wanted to do is echo the path variable, and I want to put that in my home directory, um, cron path dot txt. All right. And what this will do is echo this variable so we can see what cron actually sees as its path. All right. Uh, it's not there yet. We have to wait for it to flip over to the next minute. And Lewis, yeah, I don't know, Lewis, if you looked at our weekend assignment, uh, I normally do make a, a script as well. However, you have to make sure that your script doesn't depend on an inherited uh, path variable as well, uh, because that can cause a problem. Like if your script doesn't use absolute paths to things as well. So I'm going to talk about a couple of ways that we address this. But first, I want to show you, oh, let's do that. Yeah, show it up. Okay, so if we look at cron path now, oh, come on. Now, why is that there? I even tested this. I have no idea why it thinks that is the full path. That is crazy. Well, don't worry. I'll fix this and post edit. Actually, that's, you know, it's a live stream. Uh, <laughs> oh, dang it. That just ticks me right off. Um, wow. Hold on just a second. Let me, uh, why would it do that? Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> it's not very exciting, is it? All right. Uh, so basically, I just went to another window over here. You can probably see this now. Yeah. So I did the same thing. I have no idea why. It saw the full path in there because that I don't know if that's a more recent thing, but anyway. So I just did the exact same thing here in. Uh, I'll look in here to show you. Um, I just echoed the path variable into um, something called path.txt, and it's not there yet. So that is super super annoying. Can I do this? Yeah. How do I make this bigger? Because I'm just going to use this one. Oh, no, that's not. <laughs> All right, Windows, I don't normally like you, so how do I make you bigger? <laughs> Well, it feels like we're close now. Uh, why can't I just zoom? It feels like I should be able to zoom. Isn't it just control plus? Oh. All right. Here we go. All right. So, did it show up? Good. Let's see. Good. That's what I was expecting. Okay. So normally on a computer that is not the other, maybe I screwed the other one up somehow, but anyway, um, on normal computers, any computer I've ever used, the path that CronTab sees is very, very uh, limiting. In fact, it just includes user bin and bin. Okay. So if you are trying to run something in like uh, user local bin, whereas where I normally put my scripts, it won't execute. Now you could do the full path to that uh, to that command, and if you you know if you type in the full path, it will execute it. I think I actually created the files here too. What's what's in user local bin? I have um, cat user local bin. Let's see if I have this. Uh, what is today? Okay, and cat user local bin. What is today? All right, good. So I have in place those scripts that I, I said to put into place for the weekend assignment. Let me look at the comments. I'm sorry, everybody that 
uh, my main computer was, for some reason, had a much bigger path variable in Crontad than it should have. Uh, oh, congrats, Lewis. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, and Lewis normally makes a, a bash script, and then that's what I'm going to show you right now. <laughs> it failed at failing. That was embarrassing. Um, oh, and just to just in here, let's see. Snarko. There's a quick link to the Discord. Um, anyway, so if you run, if you type, well, first of all, if we say, that's annoying. Let me mute my Windows computer. All right, if you type, what is today? It'll say Sunday. And then the greeting will say, I hope you have a great Sunday, all right? But inside cron tab, if we edit it, first I'm gonna get rid of that because I showed you that it has a very limited path variable. Um, actually, let's no, let's leave that. Yeah, we're gonna leave that there because we'll look at that later. Um, what we can do is say uh, the full path. So we could say user local bin greeting, and then output the contents to greet.txt. Sorry, I gotta put the whole to my home directory, a file called greet.txt. And so this um, should output to our home directory that greeting, but you're gonna see the problem because even though I specified the entire path to that um, greeting command, unfortunately, the greeting command itself calls what is today without the full path. Remember, so if we look, user local bin, open up greet. This actually says, I hope you have a great, and then it just calls what is today and it doesn't specify the full path. And so it's not going to be able to uh, call that because when you run something from cron tab, it inherits the environment from the shell that started it. In that case, it's cron tabs shell and it just inherits that very limited path. Okay, so let's see if it's there yet. Yes, yeah. so if we look at greet, I hope you have a great, but it couldn't do it because it did not specify the full path to what is today. Hopefully that makes sense why we didn't see. Um, I hope you have a great Sunday. Does anybody, is that make sense to everybody? If it doesn't make sense, just mention in the comment and I'll explain a little bit further, but hopefully it makes sense um, why we don't get the proper response because that calls another script by name that happens to be in user local bin, but it didn't inherit the proper path variable to look in user local bin. It's only looking in user bin and bin. Hopefully that's clear. So there's a couple different ways that we can uh, fix it. One is you can actually specify, let me see what Cheney, so, so in the, should we need to set a variable with the path for what is today? Well, yeah, you would have to have, um, so crontab has to be able to search um, a path that includes user local bin. That's the problem. That's the solution that we have to come up with. And there's, it, it gets a little bit more frustrating even because this is what you would normally do in this kind of a circumstance is let's go let me get back here. Uh, cron tab dash E. So what you would normally do is you would just specify the path variable in here. And that's what we're going to do, except uh, normally when you do that, you can reference the path variable. And we know that cron tab has some sort of a path variable because we can echo it, remember? And it was just user bin and bin. However, this does not work. You could say path equals, normally you would say the path variable itself and include whatever is there. And then you could add user local bin. And you would expect that it would be um, user bin, uh, bin, and then user local bin. But for some reason, cron does not allow us to do this, okay? Cron will not substitute this variable as we assign it. This works in every other script that you do wanna do. Uh, you can assign the path variable like this, but this does not. Um, I could just, I could leave and you would see that it wouldn't work, but just have to just, unfortunately, trust me that it doesn't work. And so what you need to do is specify the full path in here that you want cron tab to use, all right? so. Um, I'm gonna get out of here and I'm gonna echo our path variable again. So this is our full path variable. If we want 
our cron tab to have this, we need to highlight this entire thing, copy it, cron tab dash E, path equals, paste it in. And now this should have our entire expected path anytime that it launches another script. Because when you launch a script, it will inherit the environment variables that it was launched with or from. So in our case, we want to have a big long path variable in here. So we'll save this. And now when it executes, crontab should have that full path. And then when it launches greeting, greeting will have that full path. And then when greeting launches what is today, what is today should have that full path as well. So again, it inherits from the parent that launches it, the environment variables. So what all that means is if you specify the full path you want in your cron tab file, all of your uh, commands should have that full path in their environment. And so let's see. Uh, 20. I don't know if that's been long enough, but let's look at greet and see. Sure enough, and it worked. Because we set the path variable to include user local bin, all of a sudden now it was able to find that what is today script because it lives in user local bin. Hopefully that makes sense because I know that that can be uh, a little, well, a little, a lot confusing, especially since we didn't cover uh, cron tab uh, before today at all. And like I said, that's coming up in the Linux Plus stuff where I'll cover that in much more depth. Uh, but let's go back into cron tab. You could also specify a path for each command. So for example, if I didn't want to specify it up on the top for like anything that we launch, uh, we could put it down here as well. Um, you know, export path. It's just a messy way to do it. You could also source the whole system environment uh, by doing something like, uh, let's see. Uh, I want to make sure that I get the syntax correct here. Uh, source, etc. Environment in Chrome. <laughs> yeah, I can't export it. This really is the best way to go about it. Um, uh, and I lost, I lost my window. Oh, there you are. Anytime you want to reference a path, make sure that we put the path variable. Uh, anytime you want to execute something that is outside of a very limited scope that a cron tab has as its path variable. Remember when it was just bin and user bin? If you want to reference something, generally the, the general knowledge is to do what we did here. You just specify the full path. So if you want to execute a command that is not in like bin or user bin, you could just specify the full path and it will execute. But that becomes a problem if the thing that you are launching also references other commands that happen to be not in that very limited scope because, again, it inherits that really minuscule path variable. So if you want to make sure that anything you execute here and anything that this launches in turn uh, works, if you set the path variable at the very beginning, that will allow all of the things that run uh, to use that. Uh, bear in mind, yes, and Lewis makes a good point that some distros have commands in different paths. That's why I um, that's why I specifically looked at what my user's path variable was set to, and I copied that and I pasted it in, right? Because like if you look here, like user local games happens to be one that might not be in everybody's path in every system. Same thing with a snap bin, right? This, if your system doesn't use snap packages, that's not going to be in your path. And so you do want to make it specific to the system that you're on, um, or just make sure you always use the full path name uh, when you're launching programs and when you write your script. So this is another, uh, this is one other solution that I will go over here. Let's uh, delete this, this thing altogether. All right. So we're deleting that. Uh, we don't care what the path is anymore. If we launch user local bin greeting, with its absolute path, it doesn't matter what our environment variable is because we've launched it using its full path name. So let's save this. But now, what if we edited 
uh, not etc. User local bin greeting. If we edited this so that it doesn't just call what is today, but it actually calls user local bin what is today, and we specify that it needs to use the full path when it executes that, now, uh, let's see. All right, let's just get rid of everything in here. Okay, so now, because both the cron tab is specifying the complete path to greeting and inside the greeting script, it is specifying the full path to what is today. Since it we've specified the full path, it doesn't matter what our path variable is. The path variable just tells the system, okay, I named something. You better look in these different folders to see if it's an executable file. But that's only uh, pertinent if you don't specify the full path because now, nope, still not there. I need to yammer for a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that um, you, if you specify the full path everywhere, it's not an issue. It, but if you don't specify the full path, it can be an issue where cron just doesn't launch it because it, it's not in cron's path. So that's why you'll see, usually if you see like a cron tab online that somebody has like pasted a line for you to paste into your cron tab, it will specify the full path to whatever command they're trying to get you to run because the cron tab by default has such a limited path uh, environment variable that it won't find it if it's in somewhere like user local bin. Okay, let's look at greet. I hope you had a great Sunday. Again, because we specified in our greeting bash script to use the full path to what is today. Hopefully that makes sense, okay? Um, we can source an environment file inside cron and i was going and i thought that was a little bit yeah generally what you do is uh, you can source like etc i think it's just etc environment isn't that the name of the the system wide let's see cat etc yeah so this is the um the etc environment variable is generally where a system keeps its default you know path variable and what you can do is source it by just doing like a dot and then, et cetera, environment. Um, but that's confusing. The the dot thing has always been confusing for me as far as like sourcing another file. So I didn't want to necessarily do that. But yes, uh, Lewis is absolutely right. You can source an environment file inside Cron. I've only ever seen that uh, per command. So generally like you'll source it and then you'll execute something right after that. And uh, it won't be a system-wide um, sourcing of the cron file, I think. Um, you can use source. Okay, that, I didn't even realize that, Lewis. So uh, you can actually use the word source to reference a file, and it will then load that into memory. So yeah, there, there are ways to fix it. The biggest issue is to know that cron has such a limited path by default. You always assume, or at least I always assume, that since it's my personal cron tab, it's going to share my path variable uh, that I use on a normal day, you know, on a normal day to day basis, but that's not the case. And so that was the whole point of, of this weekend assignment. And I think, uh, uh Shane, um, oh, first of all, yeah, the, the global, it just doesn't inherit the global variable. The cron tab doesn't, uh, inherit the, the global environment variable. So unfortunately that's, that doesn't work. Um, I'm going to show the field on boot really quick because I, I mentioned uh, in the weekend assignment, a link to a little short that I did on a, a cool cron tab shortcut that had nothing to do with this. And I made it even more confusing. And this is a good question too: cron versus cron tab. Um, we're going to cover that in the video probably next week in 1.4. Uh, there's a system wide cron. The cron daemon runs both the system wide cron and the cron tab for the user. Uh, but cron... Um, can run system wide, not attached to a specific user as well. So we're going to cover that in a whole nother uh, video. Like I said, probably next week, maybe the week after, depending on how how complex the uh, rest of this video that we're currently or this uh, objective that we're working on Linux Plus might be. Um, see my cron tab again. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's look at. It. And I probably erased what you needed there, didn't I? Cron tab dash e. Yeah, that's not very helpful because I just did that. Uh, sorry, Mason. Um, the thing that I, yeah, I erased the the path variable that I had in here. I just, all I did is copy and paste um, my current path environment variable, and I assigned it at the very top of this. That's that's what I did. And then this last solution is um, I made the absolute path in the two scripts uh, so that it was always an absolute path. So 
Anyway, oh, and then the other thing, so uh, Shane, you brought up the the YouTube short that I did. Basically, you know, I, I briefly explained these five fields, you know, where it's like what minute of the hour, uh, what hour of the day, uh, what day of the month, what month of the year, and then what day of the week. So those are the five fields that you can specify how often it will uh, do re something recurring. But you can also, instead of those five fields, just put at reboot. And then uh, we can do, you know, use user local bin greeting. Uh, And now every time you reboot the computer, it will actually put that in, um, it will execute that just the one time on reboot. In fact, let's do that. We're about done here, right? So, uh oh, okay. So we'll see, I'll log back into the test server as soon as it reboots and we should see that greeting uh, on the, uh, in our home directory that will execute just the one time. Yeah, there are others too. There's um, at hourly and at daily. Um, yeah, there are a few others. Oh, sorry, I put that on the screen. There are a few others. I don't remember exactly what they are. Uh, the one I use the most is um, at reboot because that's something you can't schedule with the five fields. You know, I mean, you can schedule daily, you can schedule hourly, but uh, that reboot is a pretty specific and kind of cool thing uh, that you can do. I used to always just uh, mess with, um, oh gosh, what is it even called now? Oh, the rc.local, uh, which was a way that you can execute things once on boot. Uh, but if it's a, a user thing that I wanna execute, I'll just put it in my cron tab and add reboot and boom. Like if I need to start up uh, an SSH tunnel or something as a user, I will just put it in there on reboot. It'll execute that uh, one time, pardon me, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, Let's see. Oh, good, it did it. Yep. So it executed it just that one time. And if we do ls minus minus l, we're gonna see it did the started thing at 1931, but now it's doing the other one every minute because that's still uh, in my cron tab as well. But it won't do another uh, one of these until I reboot the computer again. So that's that's how that reboot flag works. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So yeah, Lewis brings up a point here, and this is one of the reasons that I, that I don't do it. Um, hourly, um, I mean, hourly makes sense. Usually, I mean, you would assume the top of the hour, um, daily or well, what time during the day, you know, it, it's a little nondescript and the cron daemon itself, the system-wide cron daemon, um, is something we'll look at. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't know that some distros don't even support it. I hope they don't drop the reboot um, flag in the user cron tab, because that one, like I said, is very useful and it's something you can't schedule using those time fields. Uh, so anyway, uh, start with the basic question. What is cron run by the user who is logged in? Uh, it's run with, so to answer this question in <laughs> kind of a complicated way, Mason, um, the cron tab is executed with the permissions of the user that is doing that personal cron tab. So I think it, you know, it actually runs the system cron daemon executes it, but it uses the privilege of the user. So as you can see down here, um, and I have to clear the screen so you can see it. Uh, so these files were created with my user and my group. So um, yes, it's executed by the users whose cron tab it is. But I mean, if you want to get really technical, it's executed by the cron daemon using the, um, you know, privileges of the user who specified it. I hopefully that I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to weasel out of the simple answer. I just didn't want to be uh, deceptive. And as far as what's actually happening behind the scenes. Okay, good, good. Uh, let's see. I missed one. Uh, and I Googled auto running scripts came from the system D. Yes. Um, so system D, okay, I'm gonna go back to my full, my full face here. Um, and I'm gonna move the chat filter by or the, so I love system D. I used to hate system D. So system D is a replacement for a lot of things in, in Linux, but it uh, system V or system five, and I still to this day don't know which way to say it properly. Um, 
was the way that startup scripts happened. You would start programs uh, using sysv scripts. Uh, you may have seen like um, et cetera, and it dot d r c dot one two three four. All of those were part of uh, sysv or sys five, however you say it. Uh, System D replaces that whole concept of how, and it does other stuff too. But in this regard, it it replaces how programs start up. And I hated it at first because it was different, right? I mean, I'm comfortable with something and, and it's very, very frustrating when things change. Um, but now I, I do really like system D. In fact, if you look at my YouTube channel, I use system D to start my Docker programs. Like if I have a program that is running in Docker, I will use a system D init script to launch it instead of using Docker itself. I don't like Docker's auto restart functionality that's built in. So I personally use a system D init script to launch and keep all of my Docker, um, the Dockerized applications running. That's just how I prefer to do it. And so I, yeah, there's a, there's a video on my channel about uh, doing that. I, I'm pretty sure I go through how to set up the, the system D um, init script. Cause you have to do like daemon reload and everything to make sure that it's, it's loaded in memory correctly. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan now even though I wasn't before, um, of system D. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. And, and yes, that's very true. And I did cover that in, in a, not specifically for cron tab, but yeah, the standard error is great to redirect to so that you can see them. And by default, um, any output that isn't redirected to a log file, like if there's output from a command that's in your cron tab, the system will try to email that output to you. It can be a little weird if you don't have any sort of email set up, like even local email, uh, but it will try to email you things if, uh, if there's an output from a command inside cron tab. So generally I will redirect all output and uh, standard error to a file uh, just so I, you know, I, I don't get flooded with emails when things go wrong. Um, cron runs and system shall not user session. Yeah. And that's, that's where the thing, it, it it's just, I mean, that's where it, it has a path variable, but it's very limited. And I don't know why that initial thing that I showed you, it should not have had that full path in the system that I demonstrated before I went to the second system. I don't know why it was like that. Maybe I was fiddling with it and I screwed something up, but generally you get that very limited path in cron tab. So you have to be conscious of that and address it either by specifying a different path or by, you know, putting exact or, you know, full complete path names when you launch a program and make sure your scripts use the full path too, uh, if you launch any of them. And yeah, uh, Christian is correct. Everybody hated system D at the beginning. A lot of people still do hate system D. Um, I, I like how I, I like it for initialization. Um, it has taken over. It does so. It does a lot of weird things. It does. Um, its journal or like its its log output is not text. It is a binary thing, and so you need to use uh, journal CTL in order to see the output, which is a little weird, and it feels unlinuxy to not have your output, like your logged output, go into a text file that we could use other tools to see. So I think that's one of the things that upsets a lot of people. Um, but functionality wise, especially for starting programs, I do really like it. Uh, oh, and I said, some people still hate it. Lewis is one of those people. So I, I get it. Um, yeah, status service, or if you want to see an extended log of the output, you have to use a journal CTL and journal CTL will show you the binary, you know, the, a text decryption or a text version of the binary that it actually saves. Um, how would I compare cron to system D? So, uh, yeah, cron generally is used to do something on a regular basis. Uh, the at reboot flag is kind of a weird additional feature that cron has. Um, generally cron is just a system task scheduler. So cron does something over and over and over for you. Whereas, um, one of the things that system D does is, start programs as your system boots up. Now, again, system D is kind of like taking over the whole system. It does other stuff as well. Uh, but as far as initialization goes, um, system D is not designed to do things on a regular basis. That's what cron is really great at doing thing on a doing things on a regular basis. And so that's where they differ, uh, for launching things that reboot flag in a cron tab file is kind of a, 
I don't want to say it's a hack, but it's something that um, isn't used. It, it, it's useful if a user wants something to launch on boot. Normally, when you have things launch on boot, it's system wide, right? Like the root user is generally who launches things on boot. And whereas if you use that at reboot flag in a cron tab file, a regular um, user can actually have something execute on the system boot, which is just kind of cool. Um, I missed a bunch of stuff. So I think it's all cleared up in the upcoming. Yeah, the cron tab thing. I'll go. I'll go much further into cron tab and cron in general when we talk about it. So, um, yeah. Don't if if it's still a little overwhelming. Don't don't worry too much. It it gets it. Yeah. And system D and cron are not like competing ways to do things. System D. Um, handles the system initialization, whereas cron is just a task schedule for recurring events kind of thing. Um, if you're running Linux and Windows, the path you saw may have been the shell path, not cron. Yeah, so Scott, that's the issue. I was, no, that's just a virtual machine. It's a Ubuntu desktop 2204. I have no idea why it showed that full path uh, because I mean, I, I tested it and you know, I mean, the path variable that cron tab sees is normally just the system, you know, the system path, which is just bin and user bin. So anyway, I, I don't know why that happened. Maybe I had fiddled with it. it it's not, it's not a Linux system windows or anything. It's just a virtual machine. So I don't know what went wrong there. Um, already used journal CTL. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the thing. So journal, you have to use journal CTL. Whereas uh, before, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole, but that's all right. It's a nerdy rabbit hole. So system D has a log of things that it sees as it launches a program. So like as, as system D launches Apache, it has a log of all the things that it sees on the console, right? Like Apache says this, Apache says that, which is different from Apache's log because Apache keeps its own log in text-based log files in your var log folder. So Apache keeps all of its own logs, but Apache doesn't launch itself. And so um, system D keeps that binary that you can't see. You can't just like grep, uh, you know, the log file. It keeps a binary version of uh, what goes on as it launches a program. And in order to see that, you have to use journal CTL uh, and that's one of the, one of my, I, I'm still frustrated about that because, uh, the old method using sysv or sys5 again, still don't know, um, is it would just dump all of that information into var log syslog or var log messages, depending on your distribution. And you could see what was going on as it tried to launch it. And so that's where it's a little bit annoying that it's a binary formatted, uh, log of stuff as it's initialized. So anyway, but I digress. Um, let's see. So with cron, you can make a basic backup program to copy every hour, for example, files. Yes, that's exactly. Uh, yeah. If you, like a lot of times, if you want to have a, a backup of like your documents folder or whatever, you can set a cron job to run rsync. As long as, as long as rsync will run without user interaction. Um, like if you have SSH key set up or something, uh, you can use rsync to like, you know, just copy changes to another server or from one folder to another. Uh, yeah, if, if you want to do something on a regular recurring basis, that's what cron would do. For the end user, it's your cron tab file for the system, uh, like for, you know, applications running like your web server and stuff, you would use the system cron, which I'm not gonna uh, dive into the weeds now over, but um, yeah, cron is just a regularly uh, scheduled task executor. Executor? That sounds that sounds harsh. Um, oh, good. Hopefully, it's at least clear as thin mud. <laughs> like I said, I'll cover Cron a lot more in depth when we actually cover that. Um, yeah. I, again, that's my biggest complaint is that it does it. It doesn't keep a text version of the output of the initialization, which just feels unLinuxy. You know, everything in Linux is usually text files. You know, configuration files are text files and log files are text files, but systemd doesn't do that. And that's that's annoying. Um, -bum -bum. 
uh, let's see, rsync plus cron keeps the file permissions as long as um, you use the correct rsync flags. I think dash a, rsync dash a, I believe is the flag for keeping the proper um, permissions and ownership, I think. I'd have to look, but I'm pretty sure that's the, or maybe it's capital P. I don't know, but it's a matter of rsync, right? I mean, cron runs with the permission of the, cron tab runs as the, with the permissions of the user who, you know, edits the cron tab file. And so as long as you use um, rsync in a way that uh, will preserve permissions, then it will when it's run from cron tab as well. But again, you have to make sure it doesn't require user interaction, like logging in, because you can't do that in cron. You have to have a way to um, make sure that there's no, it's not prompting for a password because, you know, if you do it every minute or every hour, it's just never going to work because it's, if it's waiting for an input, it can never receive. And that's where uh, Shane actually asked a question probably on the discord, I think um, about executing like Docker compose in cron, via cron tab. Uh, that would normally need sudo. And that's where if you you can edit your sudoers file using vi sudo, and again, there's a link to that video that I, I just did recently, um, you can make it so that you don't have to edit or enter your password in order to use sudo. But you know, you have to realize that that's kind of a security risk. If you know, all of a sudden, if somebody has access to your user, then they could do that, you could specify what commands they can run as uh, you know, without the password. So there's a lot you can do with sudo, but just know that in cron tab, there's no way for you to interact with the, with the system. So if it doesn't work without user interaction, it won't work in cron tab. Uh, other pet peeve is that system D runs as root. Yeah, it, it is annoying. Um, thankfully you can specify which user you want it to run the programs as, you know, like you can say, you know, it runs as root. So you have to have root access in order to edit the the files, uh, but system D will launch programs like as the, like uh, um, www-data for like Apache, like it will run it as that user, uh, but it still requires root access to edit it. But I think sysv did as well, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I mean, I assume that sysv needed that or sys5, whatever it is, needed that as well. Um, new units, yeah, so what I generally do is just make a new service file and that's as far as I go with, um, with system D. Um, so anyway, 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 yeah, system D is really great at some things and annoying at other things. Um, everybody hated it at first. Now, most people just hate it a little bit for specific reasons. <laughs> and it, I mean, it is what it is. It's in most distributions. Now, I don't know of any distributions except maybe Slackware that don't use system D for their system initialization. Um, I don't know, maybe Arch. I don't know. Actually, most of the mainstream distributions, though, use system D for system initialization. Uh, well, yeah, Gen 2, because, I mean, they're still compiling it from 1997. <laughs> Gen 2 jokes are never old. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, yeah, I think Gen 2 probably, gosh, I don't even know. I know that Slackware doesn't. Slackware still uses, it doesn't even use sysv. It uses, um, gosh, what is what is it? Slack, it just... Um, init scripts, I think, right? Just init scripts that Slackware uses. I don't know. It's been a long time since I, since I've played with Slackware. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to get the same commands in other distros, which didn't have it. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends on what commands, like if it's, um, uh, system D it's basically how the distribution is built, right? I mean, uh, if there are, you know, a lot of common commands will exist in multiple distributions, but some don't make sense. So for example, if you're on a Red Hat system or, you know, Fedora, Red Hat or Rocky Linux, whatever, um, you're not going to have apt tools because they don't use apt as their package management system. Uh, they're going to have tools like yum or what is the new one? Um, I, I forget the new one. Yum is showing my age. Um, it's like, oh, I can't remember what it is. It's a, uh, yeah, um, DNF. So uh, DNF is like the, what apt is to Ubuntu and Debian, DNF is to RPM based distribution. So you're never gonna be able, well, not never, I don't ever wanna say never. You're very unlikely to get those kind of apps back and forth. But as far as um, uh, apps that aren't specific to a distributions like core setup, you can usually install them going both ways. 
Um, collab with DistroPew System D. I don't even know what DistroTube is. So um, yeah, System D is interesting. I you know I I use it first. I don't know a ton about it. I just know enough to use it on a on a regular basis. So um, anyway, uh, I was gonna say one more thing. Oh, <laughs> um, do you, so. Uh, it, you may have to be kind of an old timer to understand. Oh my gosh, this is exactly what I was going to say. Lewis, I swear this is where I was going. Yes, I do. Yum is yellow dog updater modif modified and yellow dog um, was a distribution designed for power PC computers like the old Apple before they switched over to Intel. Um, Yellow Dog was a distribution. I worked at a school district that had a lot of old Macs, so I used Yellow Dog a lot. And Yellow Dog came up with a new way to handle RPMs, and it was adopted by every distribution. Uh, and Yum became the de facto standard way of handling RPM files. Um, even though Yellow Dog as a distribution is gone to the annals of history because nobody uses the power PC chip anymore. Um, and I mean, Yellow Dog is just gone, but yeah, Yellow Dog updater modified is what YUM stands for. And Lewis, it's so funny that you ask that because that's exactly what I was, the question I was forming when you, when you replied beforehand. So yeah, um, that's a little bit of trivia. Whenever I teach about um, RPM, uh, package management. I always talk about that, but it's, it's less pertinent now because, you know, it, it's, I mean, I think yum is still in every dist, every RPM distribution, but most people recommend using DNF now. And so anyway, uh, yeah, let's see. MX Linux is Linux is based on Debian. Okay. I'm not familiar with an MX, MX Linux either. Um, uh, oh, DistroTube is a YouTuber making content for Arch Linux. Okay, cool. Thank you, Christian. I didn't know, I didn't know who that was or what that was. So, um, yeah, Arch Linux, a lot of people love Arch Linux. I, I, I haven't switched because, uh, Ubuntu or Debian or whatever generally works for me. Um, let's see. Yeah, that, that was cool. I'm, I'm impressed. I, all that, all that says is that Lewis and I are both old guys. <laughs> Um, because yeah, uh, that was a pretty specific, um, okay. So I talk about yum and LPIC one on CBT. Yeah. Again, whenever I would teach about it, I would always like bring up that cool bit of trivia. Um, uh, but yeah, like I said, it's less and less, less and less pertinent these days, but I, I did, I used yellow dog a lot because I had a whole bunch of old power PC, Apple computers that were pretty much useless and I would install, so what I would do, I would install Yellow Dog Linux on them, and then I would have them automatically boot an X session to our Linux terminal server. So these old like Power Mac 5500s that couldn't do much on their own, uh, they would boot Linux and then immediately go into a remote session on our terminal server, our Linux terminal server. And so they would be the same as every other thin client uh, in our district, I would just call them fat clients because they actually had to boot Linux rather than, you know, booting over the network. So anyway, um, yeah, my, my thin client setup articles that, so that was, um, the very first time I wrote in Linux journal again, uh, let me get my finger. So in that, that issue where like my, my main machine is on the cover. That was the first time I was ever professionally published. And, uh, that was in 2007. And I had two articles in that issue. I had the MAME machine, but then also about thin clients that I had set up. So anyway, yeah. Ba -ba -da -bum -bum. yeah, I'll have to look at the uh, DistroTube channel. I haven't, I haven't seen that, uh, Christian. So I appreciate that. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. It's already like almost four o'clock. Um, I'm glad everybody's stuck around this long. Uh, again, I, I do owe everybody an apology for not having the, or for talking about CronTab when I haven't really taught about it on my YouTube channel. And that's one of the things that's not frustrating for me, but something that bites me in the butt. You know, I've trained on Linux for so long when I was at CBT Nuggets that sometimes I just assume that everybody has been with me at every step of the way. Uh, because when I, I mean, 
you, if you've watched my training, it's, I mean, I train as if I was just talking to you in the room and I just assume that everybody's always there with me. So anyway, uh, I apologize for uh, putting the cart before the horse there. Uh, but thanks for sticking around. Hopefully, hopefully it cleared up a little bit. And then when we cover cron and cron tab, uh, in Linux plus, it should, uh, you'll be like, I already know this. I don't need to watch this video, Sean. We covered this in the live stream. Uh, let's see. I just passed my, oh, yesterday after watching the course. Oh, sweet. Congratulations. Um, Javi, is that, is that fair? Is that, uh, is that how I say your name? I hope if not, I apologize. Uh, but, uh, yeah, great job. That is awesome. I, that, yeah, that really, that makes me happy. So if you enjoyed it, yeah, please follow along as we do Linux plus. I know it's a longer course and it's taken a long time to, to do, but, um, yeah, it's going to, Linux plus is like this well-rounded, very, uh, fairly, I won't say very fairly in depth. I mean, if, if you get through all the Linux plus material, you're going to be pretty comfortable with Linux in general. So, um, yeah, that is just awesome. What do we have here? Uh, a link for, I mean, I'm gonna click on the link and you won't be able to see me click on it. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh yes. Oh, Lewis. Sure enough. There is back in 2005. Yeah. In 2005, what was I doing in 2005? I was, I was still, um, I was doing thin clients. I must've been doing thin clients because I got the job in 2000 at the school district. And then I got a job and had no money. The school had no money. So, um, anyway, uh, can we do some contact with DD? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we just covered a little bit of DD in, uh, in a recent, in a recent, um, L uh, Linux plus video. So it's in the Linux plus, um, it's talking about file. What is it even talking about? Does anybody remember exactly? It's in one of the last like three or four Linux plus videos. If you look in the Linux plus playlist, which should be Marco Linux plus, I think that's the link to the, to the playlist. Uh, oh no. Oh, that just took, oh yeah, that's the first video in the, in the thing. And if you look on the right-hand side, it's probably called, I don't know what video it was in. It was weird that it was in the video. Um, copy the file over the network. No, that wasn't it. Uh, archiving and compressing. No, maybe it was oxed and printf files. I don't know. I really need to maybe uh, get a better. <laughs> better description of everything we cover in every video. So it's searchable. Uh, but we did talk about DD briefly. Uh, uh, the one before last. Okay. Scott says it's the one before last. So thank you. I appreciate that, Scott. Um, floppy based router project. I remember a floppy based router. I don't know if it was the same one, but there was a while because I also, I'm close to the end of, end of the thing here, but, um, I ran, I think I ran mono wall off of a floppy for a while. Maybe it wasn't mono wall, but it was back in that time, like back uh, when, you know, mono wall and smooth wall, there were a bunch of distributions and there was one where you had to like configure it on the floppy. And, and Lewis, maybe this is the one that I'm thinking of where you would configure it and then you would make the configuration and then you would write it to a floppy. You didn't actually ever edit the live um, booted router, right? You would create a floppy in whatever configuration it was, and then you would boot from that floppy, and that would be like a static uh, router system kind of thing. Um, I think that's what it was. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Again, Lewis, everybody believed that we were old men. You didn't need to. <laughs> you didn't need to further that at all. Um, hello, it is good to see you here. I am glad that you were able to stop by. Uh, oh, yours was writable. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, any other questions? I know that I, um, uh, we're about done. I, I like, I try not to go long because I don't want people to, uh, like hang out, especially, uh, those of you who are across the Atlantic from me, cause it's already nighttime for y'all. Um, so annoying. Oh, you are not annoying at all. No, you are definitely in the right spot. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this literally why I do this and why our little group exists. So no, you're not, uh, not annoying at all. Um, uh, but please, I encourage you to um, join the Discord because there are a lot of smart people there. Some like 
<laughs> like Lewis, uh, are often smarter than me and and usually willing to help if if they can. So yeah, join the Discord. And um, I guess that is everything. Oh, you already joined. Awesome. I'm happy to see that. Um, all right. So I guess I'm going to wrap up. This is the time where I awkwardly try to find where to stop the live stream. You'd think that after all these weeks, I would get better at it, but I'm still not. So uh, thank you to everyone who joined. I will try to update the weekend assignment with the answers. Um, and for everyone who um, was frustrated by Crontab, again, I apologize. I'll try to make it up to you when I make the video uh, for 1.4 where we talk about system cron. Anyway, um, Discord wants my phone number. Oh, anyway, um, Christian, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. And I will see everybody, if, no, if nothing else, uh, next Sunday. I'll see you. Next Sunday is the day before Halloween. And our, our weekend assignment is going to be uh, appropriately themed, I think. I already know. I know in advance what next week's going to be. And um, thanks, Shane, for, for that. He's been, Shane has kind of been the guy who's been pushing, like, hey, make sure that you get this stuff out there because uh, people are really liking it. So, um, well, not Halloween. It's going to be uh, prank based. Anyway. I don't, I don't want to spoil it. Um, have a great week, everybody. And um, yeah, 90 Days of Mayhem is still going. Yesterday was day 20 already, and I haven't missed a day yet. So um, if you're not following along there, that's the last thing I'll do is I'll put this in the in the comments. 90 days of mayhem.com. Because dang damn it, I paid for the I paid for the domain, so I might as well <laughs> link to it. And um, I'll see everybody later. All right, now I really am gonna stop the stream. Thanks again for everybody. And I will see you later. Stop streaming. Oh, no, but else you're going to prompt me. Yes, I'm sure I want to stop the stream. Well, not really. I would really like to just.